So hello everybody and a very warm welcome to our audience in the room and our online audience and a very happy International Women's Day to everybody. So it gives me great delight on this day to welcome one of our best women professors on the Sussex campus, Micah Fechter, to give today's Sussex Development Lecture. Micah is a professor of anthropology and development in the School of Global Studies. Um, she's going to be talking about global solidarities um, in the context of cross-border movements. And I'm actually going to hand over to one of our IDS researchers, Becky Mitchell, who has been involved in the project that is being talked about today, who's going to introduce the talk, introduce Micah more fully, and then chair the rest of our uh, the rest of today's lecture and discussion. So Becky, over to you and have a good time, everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much, Melissa, and welcome to everybody. Um, just to run through a few bits of housekeeping before we start. So we will have plenty of time for question and answers at the end. And if you have joined us online, please could you post those questions using the chat function at the bottom um, and we will read those out or turn to you as well. Um, and there will there is a closed caption facility available in Zoom if you need it. OK, so to introduce Micah, her current research focus is on mutual aid among displaced people in and from Myanmar. Her monograph, Everyday Humanitarianisms in Cambodia, Challenging Scales and Making Relations, um, published in 2023, argues that privately funded informal aid initiatives unsettle established conceptions of scale and impact. It documents how their small acts are being linked to much larger challenges revolving around personal relationships rather than abstract notions of distant strangers. So in her presentation today, Micah will be drawing on work that has taken place as part of the Protracted Displacement Economies Project, which is a GCRF funded research project that sits in global studies at Sussex and has partnerships in five countries, Myanmar, Lebanon, DRC, Pakistan and Ethiopia, as well as working with IDS colleagues, including me and Rajiv. So we've been investigating how people living in protracted displacement situations survive economically, focusing on feminist economics, mutual aid, sustainability, amongst other things. So today, Micah will focus her work at uh, the discussion on the work that she has been leading in Myanmar. So without further ado, I'll hand over. OK, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for coming. When I got up this morning, I thought, oh, God, this is so you know, slushy and cold, you would prefer to watch it online or stay in bed. So I'm really pleased and happy that people have made it here in person. Um, so I'm also really pleased as Becky is chairing this because we have actually been traveling to the Thai Myanmar border, you know, a few weeks ago in the context of this bigger displacement project. So um, I know, I imagine that some of you have kind of, you know, know a lot about this topic. Others are probably relatively new to it. So I try to explain stuff, but I hope not to assume that, you know, you, you know nothing. If anything isn't clear, just give us a shout. And I think there's plenty of space for a discussion. And so anyway, so um, should we get started? Okay, so... The title is Solidarity and Displacement, Informal Aid Across the Thai Myanmar Border. So when I was asked to do one of the Sussex Development Lectures, I was really pleased, partly because the theme of solidarity is something that I've been sort of interested in, if not necessarily in those terms, for quite a long time. So um, I've been interested not necessarily in why people try to support others, but how that's happening what it means for understanding of what humans are like, what it means for understanding of the professional development sector. I wasn't sure if it counts as solidarity, but so I'm putting it more as a question, but it definitely belongs in the realms of um, what the psychologists call pro-social behavior or um, supportive practices as I normally refer to them. So as Becky has already said, um, this is part of the bigger project running over three years in its last year called Protracted Displacement Economies. And I'll say a little bit more about the logic of this project in a moment. So when I was asked to speak to the solidarity angle, I was also pleased not only because I think it's incredibly fascinating topic and it's become really ever more 
relevant, I think, during and after the COVID time, but also um, because it speaks to um, efforts at making visible how people in displacement um, are not just victims, to put it simply, but how our interest was how people in displacement support themselves and each other on a mid and long term basis outside of and sometimes invisible to the formal aid sector. So that's one context, the displacement project. Um, the second one is Women's Day. So when it came to timing, um, I think you said, oh, could you could you sort of say something about Women's Day? And I thought, yes, of course. Luckily, one of the three themes of the big project is feminist ethics and feminist care. So I actually start with a case of that, and we have quite a bit of that going on. I say a little bit more about the Myanmar context, and then the bulk of what I talk about is informal aid. What is it and how does it matter in the concrete context of what we've been observing? I should also say that um, our project um, has been characterized by the three big C's in our case, not just COVID, also a coup in Myanmar, and not least the cuts to the GCRF budget, which meant that Becky and myself and some other people had to work on this year on much time. So we're in the last phase, and this is ongoing data collection, and we're trying to make sense of the data, and therefore, more than conclusion, I'd be really interested to see or hear what you make of it. How does informal aid actually matter? So as um, Becky mentioned, this project goes across um, five sites. Lebanon looks very small on this. Um, Lebanon, Pakistan, uh, the DRC, Ethiopia, and last but not least, Myanmar. And even though these are often usual suspects when it comes to displacement research, um, what we're interested in is our cross-border dynamics. So if you notice, we're looking at, in each of these sites, border areas where people are not necessarily in camps, but also in dispersed settlements, in uh, semi-urban sites, in rural villages where there's history of a displacement. So that is our main framing. And the logic of that drives the bigger project is the notion of displacement affected communities. So why is that interesting? Um, because the focus quite often in research on these people have been on the people themselves, but not enough perhaps on the people left behind or the so-called host communities. Another aim of us is to dissolve the notion of host communities perhaps altogether, given that in all of our sites, there's histories and often decades of displacement that really make it not sensible to speak of a host community as such because many people who are defined as host, in fact, have histories and experiences of displacement themselves that sometimes go back generations. So we're assuming in our cross-border framework um, that there's a whole range of people who are invested in displacement, invested in, active in, part of humanitarian workers, journalists, academics like us. Um, and we really need to accept or understand um, how these work together in efforts of people themselves to keep afloat, to run shops, to get by, in addition to or entirely without of international humanitarian assistance. Okay, so International Women's Day. Um, this is a snapshot which um, one of our researchers, and I think her name was in the title and it should be, it is Eileen May, who has done a lot of the data collection for this project, not least because um, she's still in Myanmar, where she and the rest of the team are collecting data often and have very difficult circumstances. I don't think they're watching because it's quite late. But um, so she is definitely co-author on this whole material. And this is a um, snapshot from a box that belongs to a maternity bag project which is basically, this is a little booklet where um, displaced women who are pregnant are given key items that should see them through the first few stages, you know, pre-birth and just after birth to record um, data on their baby. And it um, includes a number of other key items such as uh, a feeding bra, medicines, including turmeric, um, wipes, a little lullaby book, a sling to carry babies around and blankets, as you can see. So 
in the context of Women's Day, I thought it was a good way into exemplifying what do we mean when we talk about informal aid. This project was set up by um, someone who themselves came from Myanmar and who's consented to us using the photos after May has asked her. And um, she basically said, as a mother, she felt deeply, she was now living in Thailand, but she felt deeply saddened and could not bear witness the difficult circumstances that face that faced by villagers who are being displaced as they're, you know, fleeing or um, trying to reach safe areas, while in many cases pregnant or heavily pregnant. So it was, if you like, out of a feminist solidarity that she started assisting them. And these maternity bags have been funded by networks, uh, you know, of um, social networks, people from overseas, a particular group called the Free Burma Rangers, and a network of people, in this case in Northern Thailand, as well as inside Myanmar, enables, uh, provides the infrastructure for these items to flow or to be transported across the border from Thailand into Myanmar. And they have a very good idea um, where these people are that need these items um, and get them there. So this is just one example of what we're talking about. And it also fits in with, okay, along what lines does solidarity flow? Well, one of them is that of feminist care. Now, when I was thinking about solidarity and migration, um, it is a bit, it's not tricky, but I'm, Mike and I and some others have for years ago tried to get a project off the ground on migrants and solidarity. But initially, a lot of the ways how this was conceptualized was solidarity with migrants but uh, not by migrants. Yeah, so Brighton migrant solidarity is often seen as people who are not migrants who are in solidarity with people who are, yeah, even though, you know, who is a migrant is a very big open question. So I guess what I'm, I'm trying to think about, what about solidarity among migrants? Yeah, so those affected by displacement. So for example, I was struck by a recent news article um, that, and among Rohingya refugees, um, people were sending aid to Turkey, yeah, because they shared the sense of having lost or the experience of having lost everything. It also resonates with much bigger sort of theoretical discussions, um, including that by Elena Fidian Kasmir, when she called South-South humanitarianism or refugee hosts. And um, Louise Olive has recently published a book, which I find quite fascinating, it's called Helping Familiar Strangers, refugee diaspora organizations and humanitarianism. So what is the intention behind this sort of bigger conceptual discussion is a wish to recognize that what we understand as humanitarianism is often still derived of a very particular Western liberal Christian tradition, which isn't particularly old, is often, you know, it's informal, it's, it's institutional forms are dated back to Henri Dunant and the foundation of the um, Red Cross. Um, it is often characterized by what happened after the Second World War and the whole institutions of aid that you especially are incredibly familiar with. But I think what drives us in the displacement project is kind of the will or the wish to recognize what other solidarities apart from the institutionalized ones are out there. What about solidarities among people themselves? How do they matter? What forms do they take? And how should they really shift our understanding of humanitarianism as not something that it runs along the north-south axis, but along all kinds of axes? Okay, what does that mean in a concrete, in our concrete case? So I know some of you are incredibly familiar with it, others less so. So Myanmar is um, a relatively big country um, that doesn't always figure large in people's imaginations. But um, after having come out of a sort of 10 year, nearly 10 year period of, um, let's say, this semblance of democracy, it was plunged back into um, a situation of violence um, carried out by the government against its citizens after a military coup was carried out in February 2021. So I've got some, just some news pictures here that shows that show how there was an incredibly strong um, civil resistance movement, and there still is. And um, for those of you who are interested, you find some very useful summaries on, you know, human rights group organizations, you know, the general news, Voice of Asia, and so on. So 
It is in this relatively complicated context that our research was being carried out. And of course, it is sort of a bitter irony that we were going to research displacement. And of course, the results of the coup is an ongoing massive new wave of displacement. Yeah, so it couldn't be more timely if for really, uh, you know, painful reason. So it is not in this context that our research teams carry out their work, which is, you know, very much acknowledged, but also has limits. So we're having three sites um, in the north, in the area called Tao, in the middle-ish area, in the ethnic area called Mon, and in Mindjinu, which is a sort of a resettlement group, um, not, not a camp, it's an IDP, internally displaced persons settlement. So we've said a lot about borders. This is where Becky and I were in January. This is the border between, or one bit of it, between Thailand and Myanmar. Myanmar's on the left, Thailand, we're on the Thai side, and it had just been opened that day after it had been closed for more than two years, actually due to COVID, not due to anything else. And the people you see on top of the bridge are people, I think you talked to them, didn't you? They were back from Bangkok. Is that right? Yeah, I think they did that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so basically it is also important in Myanmar context that people move for all kinds of reasons. Yeah. A lot of them are displaced due to violence, but others move to Thailand to work or to Malaysia or to Taiwan or to, or to the Middle East. So basically there's a long history of mobility for work, for education, as well as forced displacement. So our research really recognizes that there isn't necessarily a clear cut distinction, but these histories of mobility um, sort of exist with more recent waves of forced displacement. So we talk about solidarities. Um, I was thinking, you know, solidarity, the word I like to use is affinity. Solidarity means or can be acted, practiced out, practiced along lines with people who we have affinities with. So the term was originally used by Elaine Ho in one of her studies on the um, Chinese uh, Myanmar border and solidarity along Christian and ethnic lines there. But I think it's a useful term because it helps us capture in what way solidarity happens and on what basis. And um, a few examples I will go through are shared experiences of displacement or also other things, feminist approaches, ethnic ties, faith networks, as well as translocal and transnational networks. And none of these are necessarily separate. Um, you know, they often overlap and there's a bit of this and there's a bit of that. What do we mean then in practice, um, how these affinities come into play? So one thing we've done and the project is to ask, not me, I haven't done very much, but I certainly haven't gone around and, and done data collection, but people in our areas have. So um, they've asked, and uh, um, your colleague Rajit from IDS was absolutely instrumental in this. They asked people, um, have you had, or are you involved in reciprocal support among households? As in, have you extended support to others as well as receiving some back? And um, the pink bits in indicated the degree to which people have said yes. So clearly there's a lot of reciprocity going on. We don't actually know whether the people who they have supported are exactly the same who they get stuff back from because that was slightly too complex to capture, but I think it shows the spirit. What I find interesting about it that Tao O, which is a sort of a rural area where people live in very dispersed villages, um, has, has a good amount of it and so does um, Mon, but the biggest by far, um, share of yes to reciprocity was Mindjinu, which is sort of an IDP um, build setup area um, where basically everybody is an IDP. So I thought that was really interesting. It gives us a good sense that the more clearly IDPs hang together in one place, the higher the role is of reciprocity. Whereas in the relatively rural area where it is a bit more mixed, it is slightly less so. But what does it mean in practice? So, for example, some residents in the Tao O area have said, we received some food from the villagers who hosted us. We asked them, I won't read it all out, we asked them for food, and some of them, you know, rejected them. But since most villagers are Christians, they sympathize with us and accept us. 
They said, they mentioned, if they, they do not accept us, we have nowhere to go. We ended up living with them for 12 years, but we did not build a proper house. We just had a small tent. So um, this is a Karen um, area. And um, you also see that the mention is of Christians. So there is an aspect of sort of faith-based solidarity there as well. So there's other examples um, of relatives as well as neighbors kindly offering their assist assistance, not because they were asked, but we share voluntarily. And um, there's also the mention of we help our neighbors, but they're not villagers from other villages, they're from our village. And sometimes they face financial difficulties with the food. So we give them rice to help. So what I thought was interesting about that, and that is a matter for our research, and I'll get back to that in the end. You know, we often think about sort of Mm, crisis changing stuff, you know, a displacement crisis, a, a, a military intervention and so on. But what comes out in many of these um, testimonies is that um, the assistance that's been offered is based on ties that existed already, as well as practices that are often part of everyday life. Yeah, so when people have um, difficulties, you know, they don't have enough food, you help them with food, sometimes with money, sometimes with building a house. So in that sense, this kind of crisis doesn't necessarily rupture these relationships, it builds on them. Okay, so what does it mean in other times? For example, um, in the, um, we have other informal settlements around Myanmar that house quite a few internally displaced persons. And um, we have one example by a woman who's chosen the name Do Chan, and uh, we've written a blog about her if you wanted to read that up. And she illustrates another reason why people support each other's in displacement. So she was originally, um, well, she was the child, her parents ran a boarding school in her local area, and they had IDPs coming to the area, and she taught them sort of as a voluntary activity. But then fighting came to her area, her family was displaced. And um, she ended up in this settlement. And there again, she began taking this, this is the picture she took. She began taking small kids in um, to start up a preschool um, to make sure they weren't just, you know, hanging around the houses, but had input, being looked after, and so on. And um, when she said, she kind of commented on that herself, somewhat ironically, saying, Well, I've gone from, from volunteer. Um, to IDP, to volunteer teacher and back. Yeah, so this weaving in and out of solidarity, you give it, then you actually need it. And while you are in need, you give it yourself again. So all of this really goes against the clear definition that is so often perpetuated be between donors and recipients, yeah, between donors and beneficiaries. In this kind of more holistic view, like I showed, showed at the beginning in the, of the um, diagram, the whole the displacement affected communities, you know, IDPs can be volunteers and beneficiaries at the same time. And this is even bracketing a, you know, a bigger discussion about whether everybody who volunteers is already a beneficiary in many ways anyway. The other thing that this kind of somewhat, you know, dry assembly of um, houses illustrates is, apart from the bottom left, is this uh, Manjini settlement. The bottom right shows a um, preschool store school that was set up with the help of an Austrian NGO. Yeah, so the beforehand on the top left is an ethnically uh, based support to IDP schooling in another area. On the bottom right is the result of a transnational cooperation where somebody from Europe organized money through their social networks in order to help them uh, you know, set up the school building as they wanted to. So all of these networks uh, remind us how these flows of resources are organized. Education is a prominent uh, theme and not it runs sometimes along, not always along ethnic lines, for example, in the border town of Mesot, where we were in January, um, this is one of the schools, the Satoulet uh, Burmese Migrant Workers Center School, I think it's called, um, where the students were just in the middle of a session. Then we have the Self Access Language Learning Center. And this is just one example about many sort of migrant run and organized educational centers 
which are especially vital as people, as you often as you may be aware, that um, people who are displaced are often excluded from state education in the countries where they arrive. So this fills a real need. And this is a little thing that I just included, which I took a picture of, promise us not to give up. So the motivational um, you know, impetus that these organizations provide should really not be underestimated. Okay, so I've raised this very briefly at the beginning. Um, the maternity back project. I wanted to look a little bit about more into it because um, it shows us how these strands are not just single issue based, but kind of weave together. So these are people who in Northern Thailand um, come from the local university. Um, some of them are yeah, students, some of them are volunteers. Um, some of them are sub get money from established NGOs. And um, for example, they assist with sewing nappies, um, ironing them, as you can see, um, and buying turmeric from the market or harvesting their own turmeric in order to put into these bags that I showed you at the beginning. So you might also say that because most of the people involved have experiences either of displacement, of shared ethnicity, or of, say, motherhood, one argument goes that actually these informal aid practices that are organized along those lines have a better chance maybe of being appropriate and targeted than something that may come in from an international organization straight away. For example, there is a strong emphasis on local medicines, you know, turmeric, pepper, appropriate slings to wear, you know, books in proper languages, lullabies, and so on. So all of this didn't need much thinking. It was quite clear, I think, to the women who were involved what needed to be in there. And they also had um, feedback, obviously, from the pregnant women who were using these things. Um, this is an example of another group of IDP um, women who've recently given birth in displacement, but they're not necessarily exactly the same who um, were the recipients of the bags. Okay. Um, I don't know if anybody has heard of the Free Burma Rangers. You haven't. Okay, right. There's a film about them. I'm raising this because maybe also to raise ethical questions. Um, medical assistance, that's one on the left hand is in Kayin State, a member of an ethnic armed organization um, providing medical assistance. When I teach about this, our students are sometimes really surprised that armed organizations can also be humanitarian actors. Hang on, how is this? What does this mean? Where are the borders? What are the boundaries between this? Does it make them good people? Can they be both at the same time? Do they give out assistance indiscriminately? A good example, uh, or one example, is um, an American, a son of American missionaries called David Eubank, who you see on the top right, um, who has set up an organization called the Free Burma Rangers, which is definitely sort of a Christian-based, mm, to some extent, missionizing Karen-embedded mm, organization. And who I spoke to his wife and the person who leads the operations in the ground last year. And um, they recruit Karen people in order to provide emergency, emergency medical aid in the border areas where um, groups sort of are affected by military strikes. And he has involved most of his family, you can see him on the right hand side then. So the Free Burma Rangers are interesting because they illustrate sort of an ethnic based intervention group, transnational networks, yeah, because some of the money he raises comes from the US, very much a faith based area, a faith based sort of affinity, as well as a long standing presence in his case in Thailand. But it also is a good case because it raises questions, you know, what about the missionizing? Um, are they medics with guns? So they do have, um, they are armed, but just for self protection. Um, but for example, obviously, there it is not uncommon that they lose some of their Karen um, colleagues because it's quite a dangerous intervention going into sort of the aftermath of an airstrike or battlefield, and you know there are casualties. You know, is that is that ethical? So I think that that is an interesting aspect of informal aid that is worth dwelling on. How legitimate is it? Who decides that? Who is it driven by? And this sort of the intervention, you know, in between local and international networks. Then, and finally, 
that what I mentioned at the end is the um, fundraising across borders. And that's something I've done a bit more in my own my previous research project on Cambodia. And you probably, is my guess, also know someone who's setting up a nursery in Ghana, who gives 10, 20 or $50 to someone they've known in the Philippines because they did volunteer placement there. Maybe it's just somewhere in Eastern Europe that you've traveled to or someone else has traveled to and now you know someone who could benefit from being put to school. So this kind of informal aid streams are not really quantified, but they're potentially quite important. You know, then, I mean, part of our project tries to quantify these a little bit more. The example I have here that May has um, worked on is something called the Free Bird Cafe in Chiang Mai, who um, through, you know, fundraising activities, cafe activities and so on, raises money for goods and food that they then manage to get across the border. So the translocal as well as the transnational aspect in this informal aid is quite important. Um, and finally, uh, May also found it very important, there's a group called Clean Yangon, which is entirely Myanmar based, but sends aid to the border. So it was started well before the coup in order to improve Myanmar, and but is now carrying out humanitarian assistance healthcare, food, education, and so on. So the interesting thing about Clean Yangon, and I think that holds for much of cross-border aid, is that they are a bridge. Yeah, so they describe themselves as a bridge that connects to those who would like to help and those who need help. So those of you interested in migration studies might have come across the concept of migration infrastructures. Yeah, and this is such an example where we have, whether you call them intermediaries, brokers, or aid infrastructures that are people or groups who crucially have personal connections, are affiliated with organizations that can border cross, and who have local knowledge, who are able to get rice bags across the border. For example, I'm not going into too much detail here for... <laughs> because it's, I think, politically not wise, and it's not necessarily to lay out all of these. This is from Facebook, for example. But the ethnic armed organizations also have ways of getting materials, rice, in small portions across the border. They can't necessarily load up a truck with, you know, 20 um, massive rice sacks, but they can put one or two onto the back of a motorbike, cross the river, cross the border, and then, you know, at a, at a low profile place and get them to where they're needed. So these kind of informal networks, the infrastructures, if you like, are absolutely crucial for this informal aid. And this is what sets them apart partly from international organizations. Okay, so what does it all mean? So I think you've seen how ethnic ties being Karen, being Mon, being Christian, being Buddhist, living in the same area or having diaspora connections, um, how they can motivate and also shape informal aid across borders. And how, going back to what I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, it's important that pre-existing networks are being activated. Yeah, so there's con some extent of continuity rather than just rupture and crisis. That doesn't mean obviously that everything is like before, but what I found interesting or what the interesting question for us is I think, in what ways do everyday support mechanisms that would that happen anyway, how are they transformed, utilized, damaged, exhausted, or, or sustained in times of crisis? Yeah, because people may also say, and our project is looking at that, um, well, you know, it's all very well your neighbor giving you rice, but what if your neighbor runs out of rice? Then that would last very long. Okay, so that is an obvious. And uh, the sustainability question is an obvious one that you might ask to these forms of informal aid. You know, <clears throat> how do they play out in the midterm? How does it matter conceptually? Um, one thing I'm quite interested in, because I started looking, and of course we all teach on humanitarianism and uh, more short-term humanitarianism and long-term development aid. And it is, um, characterized by some principles, for example, independence, neutrality, and impartiality. But what I could see in this informal aid that it is not necessarily impartial. It is completely, or to some extent, based 
on affinities based on faith, ethnicity, gender, locality. Yeah, not entirely. So you have transnational connections um, that are simply, you know, you know the person because your cousin has volunteered there. That's your connection to them. But it does contribute to our understandings to these four areas. So I want to quickly look at what that means. So Becky mentioned at the beginning, um, so I have a book. It's not published yet. It's just in press. It's called Everyday Humanitarianism in Cambodia. And it's based on a few years uh, work in Cambodia on these small scale aid organizations or projects. Uh, but what's fascinating, I think, what I found there, that is partiality that makes these things run, not neutrality or impartiality. Yeah, it's having connections, knowing people, being similar or creating similarity that is an extremely strong driver. And um, originally, sort of the, the more theoretical questions in the book are, is really a question of futility that also pertains to informal aid. If you can do such a small thing, how can you keep going in the face of the problem that is so much bigger than that? What point it is to bring a rice bag across the border if there's thousands of people displaced? Yeah, how do people make sense of this? And there are found various ways in which they do make sense of this, but yeah, that's in the book. And then the other aspect that came out in my research there, and that I think we're also realizing in the Myanmar and border project, that it is these relations, whether they're given or made, um, that are absolutely central in informal aid. Not that they're not important for formal aid, and Rosalind Ivan has demonstrated that very well, but it is really important if we think about how to help, how aid runs, that is a cornerstone of that. Second, what's the big meaning of informal aid? I think it has a massive um, impact on the so-called localization debate, which some of you have made you know, research on or have been taught on. So what I find slightly grim about the localization debate that it is a transitive verb, localizing aid. Yeah, as if something that has to be localized. But in everything we've seen, a lot of we've seen in the Myanmar project is that this aid is local already or translocal, if you like, if you talk about crossing borders. So really, um, it is really important and it's high time to go away from this north-south axis of, oh, here's aid and it needs to be localized. Yes, it means dispersing more funds directly to local organizations. And we've already realized that very little of this has happened. Yeah, since the first 2015 pledge to make more of this happen, a recent report found that you know, an absolute fraction has been implemented. So I think it is definitely important to um, think about or to, to recognize that aid in many ways is already local in crisis and in everyday life. Okay, so I've got a, it's a bit obscured, but I took part or I, I um, watched a seminar event in the um, Overseas Development Institute in December called Beyond Neutrality, Alternative Forms of Humanitarian Action. And I think if the ODI sits up and pays attention to this, it's probably time to look at it properly. So some call them non-traditional actors, um, which help us push the, the terms of the localization agenda but also what, you know, Fidian Kasmi says about South-South humanitarianism, shift the narrative that supports flows predominantly among, along a North-South axis. For example, and it's not just the, you know, Lebanese people supporting Syrians or not, or people in Jordan or people in Turkey supporting refugees. In my Cambodian work, for example, it was a lot of people from Japan, South Korea, Malaysia and Singapore who came to Cambodia to do aid. Yeah, so it, this kind of South-South humanitarianism or development aid doesn't feature enough on how we teach and understand um, aid and development. Final slide. Um, people, when we talk about this, um, students and others say, oh, this is just letting people off the hook, isn't it? It's fine, refugees and internally displaced people are fine. They just share rice, you know, they don't need governments, international aid organizations, civil society organizations. You know, I'm not going to use the dreaded word resilience. So there's very clearly a risk, and that's partly or why I haven't got into the complete detail of it, to say, oh yeah, they look after themselves. They don't actually need much intervention. 
and it lets others such as you know state agencies international aid agencies off the hook but i think what is it and i know that is a risk and a tension but i think what is at stake there is it also a different idea of the human you know especially in um which is not out for individual gain and and greed and at home economicus but is as Piotr Kropotkin argued in the 19th century um a, a part of what it means to be human yeah so he argued um, that he observed sort of collaborative behaviors both among animals in Siberia but also among society in societies and he argued that mutual aid was in fact a factor of evolution and interestingly enough and um, I think just last year um, Dean Spade has said, brought out a book called mutual aid building solidarity during crisis which is specifically related to COVID so I think it is not coincidental that themes of mutuality and solidarity have come to the fore, maybe occasioned by crisis, but not contained by it. And I think if we can contribute in our project to, if not shifting, at least querying these fundamental notions of what humans are like, then we've already done a big thing. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Micah. Um, does anybody have any questions they would like to ask? If we have a few, we might gather some up. Are you doing okay? It? One question each is okay. Do you want to do one at a time? Yeah. Okay. Brigitte? Thanks um, for that. was really interesting. I yeah, thank you. That was really interesting. Um, I was just wondering if you looked at anything to do with what impact um, people getting formal aid had on relationships with uh, like the people who they got informal aid from, if it caused tensions, if some got it, some not, what, what that did. Um, and then also maybe if some people got left out of those informal aid structures. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I Good point. Um, these informal aid streams are not necessarily more inclusive. Yeah, they engender their own exclusions, absolutely. And one of our collaborators, Ashley South, has all writ has written on this, for example, in the aftermath of Cyclone Nargis, where it was about Christian and Buddhist aid groups and where aid flew, you know, um, went to. I think it's the question of paying attention to that and documenting it. So it is not as such a better thing but it is a different thing. And there's also some very good work about how mutual aid groups among uh, BAME groups in the USA have intensified racial inequalities. Yeah, so the best intentions, um, they are not necessarily by design more equal or create more equality. So yeah, good point. We go for a deep turn and then work our way back. I think Michael had a preference for one at a time. <laughs> Thank you, that was fascinating. I'm going to return back to the theme of International Women's Day. Um, <laughs> understandably, I probably think. Uh, but um, I just wanted to kind of um, ask you a little bit more about. Um, the 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 aid that um, you 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 showed us about the maternal aid and also you know setting up childcare centers etc. And I'm trying to figure out, but 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 then the medical aid was very much given by men who are you know these these groups of militia or whatever. And and so I'm trying to I'm trying to kind of understand what are the gender dimensions of this aid beyond beyond the kind of like immediate maternity and childcare, which, which kind of relegates women to a very specific position of like, you know, so women get aid as mothers or potential mothers, but what, what, what are the general other dynamics of, of the, uh, mm. the aid, of the mutual aid that, that's happening? In mm. death? Yeah, it's a really good point. I mean, we've observed it as well in our workshops. When there was, a, you know, when, for example, <laughs> There's loads of gendered hierarchies and divisions, I would say. You know, from what we observed um, and know more broadly, quite a few of the ethnic armed organizations are 
staunchly patriarchal. So, um, yeah, the, and there is sort of the medical emergency intervention, which is kind of often a quite male dominated domain. And whereas the maternity bags, um, you know, perhaps unsurprisingly, are led by women's groups. I mean, you could say, but at least they are getting a bit of attention. Yeah, if you only had sort of battlefield medical intervention with absolutely no care for the pregnant women in a camp, then that would be even worse. That doesn't make it, you know, that still doesn't do away with the equality. The other good thing I think that we've observed is that, you know, parts of Myanmar, especially the ethnic groups, have incredibly strong women-led um, CSOs that we work with. And, and they are the bridges or the networks or the infrastructures for quite a bit of cross-border aid. And there's also quite a few women who have come to more political prominent position in the ethnic in the alternative government and so on. So it's a very mixed picture. So there was a question in the next row, and then there's going to a few online that I think we might turn to, but we won't forget you at the back. Yeah, thank you for presentation. My question is about host community. I mean, my experience in Jordan, it's a refugee camps. We mainly support for the refugees. However, we also I found it's also important to support community host community as well because host community have some burden with its new people coming in the capacity of education, hospital, whatever. There's some like burden, and there's gonna be some potential conflict reason which only like support for new people, not only not like local people you just hear. Mm. Is there any case you found in Thailand or Myanmar? Yeah, I mean, it's a very complex picture. I try to be very simple about it. Um, I think what is interesting about Myanmar, but not unique, is these absolute histories of displacement. Yeah, so Fidian Kazmi also shows how there's tension between old refugees and new refugees, and you may have that. Um, but there's also the bigger context of sort of this democratic resistance, which builds bridges among host communities and IDPs because they are actually politically on the same side. I mean, our overall project tries to question the notion of a refugee as a burden, hopefully not just by easily, cheaply showing that they can pay their way and they pay more taxes like they do in the UK, not refugees, but you know, people with migrant backgrounds or, yeah, they, they can have shops and contribute to the economy. Um, I think what is interesting, what has come out of the mind you know, case we've got, that refugees can also be assets or IDPs can be assets. For example, there uh, is a local monk you know, attached to, to a pagoda, a religious temple, Buddhist temple, that hosts refugees, but make them do what they call voluntary labor or merit labor. Yeah, sort of paving roads and making inscriptions, getting a bag of rice per month. So we've been discussing with, with May and others if to what extent this is voluntary. Yeah. And in other of our project sites, we have seen that landlords, you know, benefit from, from refugees by having extortionate rents. We have NGOs that have refugees as clients and ensure their survival and so on. So I think just with the donor and beneficiary binary that we have to let go of, this kind of host and, and um, guest binary is just too blunt in many cases. Thanks, Micah. There's a question online that I think would be helpful for kind of clarity before going further. Um, Isabella asks, can you cl clarify the definition of informal aid? <laughs> is local NGOs efforts to support IDPs regarded as informal or formal? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Very good question. Um, I was pushed on this. Um, I mean, there's an easy definition of formal and informal, which means being a registered entity. Yeah, so for example, in the US, if you're part of the charity register, I think it's what's called NRS or something, um, you can you can have tax deductible donations and that makes a big difference. And then you're formal. But a lot of what has been described as amateur aid by Alison Schnabel, for example, who worked on these groups in the US and in South South Africa, even though they're registered, they're very small. They act informally, they come, they go, they have very few staff. Um, they have all the hallmarks of what you would call a, a private project. So even though an entity may be formally registered, doesn't necessarily mean they are 
an NGO in the sense that we often think about writing reports, being accountable, having status that allows them to receive funds from larger donors and so on. Yeah, and there's many reasons that I found in my old research why people don't want to formalize. You know, they don't want to do reports, they don't want to have accounting or not at least upward rather than downward. So there's many disadvantages of that. So I would say the bond, this boundary between formal and informal is not always clear, but I have to say, I haven't got a clear cut answer to that. Okay, the follow up question to that uh, is, I would like to understand in what way aid provided by women is feminist. <laughs> That's a very <laughs> good point. Um, I, I've thought about that as well, but I think when we talked to um, the person who initiated the project, um, was a very clear sense of sort of what I would call feminist solidarity. Yeah, so the sense that women's needs are often overlooked in IDP situations. Yeah, so there was a clear political um, will to actually say, no, I know they need medical intervention, or, you know, when you're on the side of a battlefield or an airstrike, they also need training, but they also need um, stuff that is specific to women and that is likely to fall through the register. And in that little sense, you know, feminist with a small F, I think I've included in that, but, you know, it may not be feminism with a big F for sure. Great, thank you. Dov, and then the gentleman at the back. Thank you for a fascinating presentation and um, prompting a few questions about the sort of the, the north-south axis, if you like, or the established international humanitarian system, um, perhaps with a capital H rather than the small H that you talk about. To what extent do you feel they are already responding to this challenge of the, the non-traditional actors or their networks or these informal forms of aid? Um, Related to that, sort of what does it take for them to better notice it? And perhaps if I can sort of challenge, maybe, do you reckon sort of they might actually become sort of a danger sort of to these informal aid mechanisms exactly for those reasons around sort of formalization uh, requirements, et cetera? Thank you. Yeah, it's a very good point. I mean, I've tried to look into this um, so far, more in the Cambodian research I've done. One, but also in the UK, and one response that comes from larger organizations is that they find the interface problematic. Yeah, so they find it difficult to disperse money. They need certain mechanisms in place, standards, grant applications, uh, accountability, transparency, without which they can't really do much with these funny little things. Yeah, and sometimes for good reasons, because, you know, informal aid, like I said, isn't that always a good thing? Like people have raised the issue, it can be a smokescreen for abuse. You know, there can all things and orphanages can go on there under the heading of informal aid. So it's right to be wary of it. Um, there have been a few years ago, there was a big project, I think, from then DFID called Amplify. So that's now being disbanded, which probably means it hasn't gone so well which was meant they were trying to sort of focus on and blow up and, and, and identify small outfits that would benefit from more funding. So with, with that statement, oh yeah, you small actors, you're doing good stuff, can we put money your way? Yeah, so it's worth checking that report out. My impression was that the interesting shift that's happening is not so much how can the big organizations um, interface better with these amateur or small informal ones. My sense is that it's worth looking at sort of crowdfunding and crowdfinancing, because that is how a lot of small outfits get funded without the same reporting and training requirements. Yeah, and I, we really need to know a lot more about the money streams that go that way, because I think there's more than we imagine. Um, and another thing, sorry, last thing, you know, when I look at how much ODA matters in relation to remittances, it's quite small, isn't it? So maybe it's worth thinking more about, because informal aid is a bit like remittances, just that it, it goes beyond kinship, and but it's, it's potentially big. Okay. Person at the back who's been waiting a while. 
Hi, thank you. So um, I'm not actually a development student, so apologies if this is covered, but um, you talk quite a bit about sort of the divide between North-South aid and South-South aid. And I was actually gonna ask about remittances, sort of how do you categorize that? I guess it's a bit of a mix of both often. Mm. And what role does it play if it pray, plays a role in the case in Myanmar? Yeah, I, I think, um, it's completely fascinating stuff because we take it for granted so often, um, but don't really say much about it, that remittances are kinship based. Yeah. And often on a relatively narrow notion of kinship, as in mm, immediate family members, even if the notion of family is quite big. Yeah. And the interesting about so kinship is one affinity, an obvious one. Um, that also matters a lot in displacement, obviously, that's quite well documented. There's two things I found interesting. Sometimes there's something called humanitarian kinship, which means that people create kin relations in order to assist someone and the other way around. Yeah, so you adopt someone and say, ah, you know, I'll, I'll pay your way through college. Yeah, and they talk about them as they adopted daughter, sons, whatever. It also works upwards that you get adopted by, you know, a local family, for example, and, and might have them along. You know, you probably in all your travels, you've seen probably little mopeds and tuk-tuks or song towels that say given by Mr. Stewart or something like that. So that's humanitarian, you call that humanitarian or, or kinship that enables assistance. Um, I would say in the Myanmar case, because a lot of our biographical interviews show that people have engaged in labor migration before and during displacement. So you can't keep them separate, really. You know, sometimes they've come back from labor migration, or do you call labor migration, all of them to be displaced and then rely on someone else's remittances. So if Myanmar case stages is anything, it is just how interwoven these flows are. I think there's more to say, but that's maybe not enough. I'm just going to turn to a question in the chat uh, from Mei Tin. Thank you very much for preparing and presenting our country's human rights violations and vulnerable population of Myanmar. It is on the ground situation. Most of Myanmar's people, including People's Defence Force and civilians, are trying to fundraise and provide informal aid to forcibly displace people in any way we can. We advocate because of the same experience and the same faith. And I feel like providing legal and formal aid is also dependent on this notion. The Thai government provide temporary shelter for most Burmese, but not Rohingya based on a religious matter. Some host population also did the same. Some refugees with strong social networks got more assistance as informal aid, but the power asymmetry is present even in the refugee and displaced populations, and it can result in inequalities. How should we address this? Shall I, shall I put the question to the audience? It's really difficult. I mean, I think, I mean, I was going to say at the beginning of the talk, if it does nothing else, at least we've raised maybe awareness of the situation in Myanmar. That's the one thing. Secondly, I think the person who's put the question probably has a lot of the answers, much more than me or any in the room, in terms of where to put your resources, how to make sure they're not further exclusionary or, or creating hierarchies. It is a tension, you know, I mean, the whole idea about the humanitarian principles based on neutrality and independence and impartiality was that it, is, it goes to all humanity, it's based on needs, and it prioritizes those who suffer most, yeah? But in practice, that's not what people do, yeah? But it, a lot goes along these sort of principles that don't follow equality lines. I'm just, you know, I'm not an ethicist, I'm just doing some empirical stuff. So I can describe what people do ethically because, um, I think that's being overlooked in the philosophical discussion on responsibility and, and aid, but maybe it is not possible to support others without creating new equalities. It's possible. Maybe there is not a good solution to that. Mm. Okay. More questions in the room? Uh, 
Um, um, thank you for the very like wonderful presentation. I'm interested in, for example, when, when we know that informal aid is kind of risky for the middleman who carry the cash into the country, and is there any negotiation between um, formal actors, for example, the military and the UN, while we know that, for example, there are a lot of UN and World Bank presents in their country. So what's the negotiation going on in terms of like development in through the formal like channel? You mean in the Myanmar case? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it is also problematic, as you know, because of the uh, military government and the military coup. So I think the tension for a lot of providers is whether it is ethical to act in Myanmar um, and, you know, in, in not collaboration, at least with tolerant, being tolerated by the by a government that many consider as illegitimate. So I think... We're looking at the Myanmar case because it's precisely in these situations where sort of these large scale formal actors um, are, are hesitant or at least don't have an office anymore in the country that these informal streams become more important and more visible. Yeah, so it was exactly when, bizarrely, when sort of in 2012, when the situation within Myanmar improved, a lot of the NGOs left the border zone, yeah, and the support for the camps at the border and rushed to set up offices in Yangon. Yeah, and then there was, again, this sort of a bit of a, um, a void that was then fueled by Christian networks who ran refugee schools and independent private people doing stuff, yeah, and, and now it sort of swooshed the other way. What does it mean? I mean, a bit like with remittances, um, you can see that remittances sort of have less of a dip in times of crisis than foreign direct investment, for example. Yeah, And I think our question with the big project is, does informal aid, how does that respond to sort of political crisis situation? And is it more resilient in that sense because the ties that fuel it endure, whereas for large international actors, that those ties don't necessarily endure. Hello. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, just wondering, um, um, so I did a lot of my field work around the Indian Myanmar border in the Chin state and Sakyang region. Um, so according to what I understand is that if, as you talk about informal aid, um, um, I'm thinking about how then, you know, this ethnic and kinship ties amongst the current people who are displaced um, for about a few decades now, mm. um, how then this would play out, you know, um, to what extent will this informal aid be if they're not in this social historical context to it? So let's say, for example, if they are displaced only after the coup, right? Uh, but they are already displaced because of religions and ethnic, being an, an ethnic minority and also living under the armed regime, right? Kind of a double regime that they're living in. So how different it would be than informal aid, um, the kind of relationship that they had within informal aid or the existences that they need, they have it now. Do you mean to what extent the existing networks that were strong in sort of in the little kind of influence, state, yeah, in influence, yeah, the influence on your other way? Um, it's tricky. I mean, some of the people that May, our co-author, interviewed were from Chin State. Um, and there's certainly an enduring connection between people from the same village, from the same area, as you find in so many refugee IDP um, situations. Yeah, So these co-location bonds and co-ethnic bonds endure. But at the same time, there is also new solidarities. For example, I think Chin in particular, but also other ethnic groups struggle to have primary education in their native language, right? And that's not just a Chin problem. So in Do, Ch Do Chan's narrative, what she told us is like she finds education so important because she's witnessed where she was from in Chin State that people, you know, kids went to school and were taught in a language actually, I think it was our Arakanese, that, that they'd never, never heard of, and it really hampered their education. So, yes, some of these old ties endure, Some, not all of them, but also other problems that seemed unique to the chin are then discovered to, or people become aware that other people suffer from the same problem. And that's 
potentially a useful thing in the bigger campaigns to provide, say, primary language education for them. But, you know, it's a good question. We'd have to, you know, look into this properly, for example, in this question in relation to Chin people and how that plays out in the long term. I mean, again, the political situation plays a role in to what extent it's sort of created solidarities politically where there were ethnic divisions before. You know, I think that's a movable situation, isn't it? We've got two uh, women on this side who were waiting for a little while. Thank you so very much. Um... Uh, kind of building on the idea of you mentioned around some pre-existing um, networks and the new ones that have formed and I wondered to what extent the new ones that you had found um, existed in terms of filling gaps that maybe other elements weren't necessarily providing kind of um, and forms of different forms of uh, non-state social protection but in what way they intersected and interacted with with the humanitarian assistance that might be provided in those areas thank you very much mm. I mean, I feel like I can't give a simple answer to any of your questions because they're really good questions. I can only think of concrete instances where I think, okay, how has that played out? For example, a large INGO or UN body has provided food or rice. Yeah, they might use ethnic armed organizations or one particular one in order to get this into areas that are affected by displacement. These might be multi-ethnic areas, not in not completely, but a bit, because you know people from an unsafe area may flee to an area that's kept safe by, say, the Karen. Yeah. So, and they would then also receive these rations or rice or whatever it is. Yeah. So, it's meant for many people. It's channeled, maybe channeled through one particular group, and then it goes again to a diversity of people. There is certain, I mean, I'm, it's so much going on. There's certainly also, um, you know, there's also humanitarian aid, like with everywhere that we've heard of that is given to, so for example, the monks in that place that we mentioned, that doesn't really reach the people that it's intended to reach. Yeah, so, um, but that's not due to the ethnic composition of the place. You know, it just gets stuck we, held back by if you like patrons for the refugees or idps so i don't know i mean we'd have to look at the concrete streams to actually give a proper answer to that um i think you can find examples of good practice as in one ethnic organization dispersing it according to need we've definitely seen that we've also seen organizations that act, act as bridges, brokers, or immediately that disperse it to their clientele, as it were. Um, there is, if you want to read up on it, a good paper by Andrew Ong and Hans Steinmüller on war state. And it's called something Multiplicities of Care and War State. And that documents in detail in one place these official, unofficial, EAO flows and so on. Thank you. Jay, on the front row. Thank you. Um, thank you, Maike. Um, I, yeah, I've been really interested in your research and, and especially in this project as well. Um, and it's great to finally get to see the Myanmar bit of the research too. Um, I actually had uh, two questions. One, you kind of answered, but then um, I, like to pose it in a different way. Um, and you mentioned about the translocal or localization of, of aid, but um, you've also mentioned um, about the complex remittance relationships uh, in Myanmar, which I've also noticed in my research in Myanmar as well. So in that sense, is it actually translocal aid or a lot of it actually based on transnational resources that form the basis of the translocal aid was my first question. And, you know, would you have happened to have evidence of the relationship between the transnational bit and the translocal bit? Um, the second question is, um, is, is also related to um, what I'm interested in researching um, from my thesis, is um, if you have seen some evidence of um, support that goes beyond the face-based uh, uh, relationships or the ethnicity-based 
relationships, um, which I think is really important. And, and one of the reasons is, is that I really appreciate your research and also Elena Fidian Kazmir's uh, research was also quite great because it also talks about this you know, different dimension of the South, South oriented um, uh, support. But then I kind of fear that uh, because you, you mentioned about the um, Western liberal tradition of aid, which is supposedly neutral, supposedly impartial, is that um, do we risk making Southern aid to be more based on um, these relationships or ethnicity based or faith based, whereas uh, oh, Western aid um, that comes from Western governments are, are impartial and neutral. So do we risk doing that with these research? Thank you. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you for raising that. Um, maybe just start with the first one. Um, I think transnationalism and transnational resource flows, whether they're remittances or diaspora or humanitarian aid, are well documented. But I think what a lot of recent research on displacement has shown is that we, we risk neglecting the translocal, which means in-country um, and usually extending between sites of original settlement and temporary shelter, resettlement, and so on, or residence. And in the Myanmar case, we had that a lot. And in other research bits I've been involved in, that displaced people's livelihoods are absolutely predicated on these translocal connections. Like they might drive back on their motorbike to the original farm, harvest a bit, drive it back to the camp or settlement, sell it there. Yeah, and or whether it's making charcoal or, or trade or whatever it is. So we really need to accept that, you know, a lot of assistance comes from the connections and differentials between the two sides, you know, the, the, the origin and temporary residence. Uh, and they, of course, they may be connected. You know, people may get remittances while they're living on the Thai side of the border and then turn them into a translocal <laughs> resource flow by getting some rice bikes across. And so I think translocal, of course, in the in Myanmar case, is also transnational because it crosses a national border. But, you know, especially these rice bags for me are such an example of translocal aid because that can be done, you know, by one person with a motorbike in a day. Not that that's the definition of translocal, but that's sort of, I think, what people imagine. Um, I think, you know, what is beginning to happen is that people... Um, sort of soften up this idea that what was used to be called humanitarianism, which is in fact, you know, the Western based liberal, but vastly Christian um, aid to, to call it such and not assume it's the default case. I mean, what I absolutely love is the exist or the emergence of Muslim humanitarianism as a research field. Like, hmm, because the rest is normal, but if it comes from Muslims, it's called Muhum, it's got Muslim humanitarianism, which just shows up our completely Christian based assumptions that need to be made visible. So I think in politically, nobody has any illusions that, um, you know, ODA isn't especially, you know, taking DFID into the FC deal you know, and so on, as if that wasn't based on existing ties, interests, and is also not neutral, is it, or, or independent and impartial. So no, I think we have to be clear or to make efforts to see what's behind, what drives these different kinds of aid without romanticizing one or pretending, you know, formal northern global north aid is as independent as it sometimes likes to present itself. Thank you, Micah. A couple of questions online. How does religion play into aid considering Myanmar is a largely Buddhist country? Um, well, there's a longer history there because a lot of the ethnic groups that populate, and I know a lot of you know more about this, populate sort of border areas are historically um, not necessarily Buddhist. Yeah, whether they are, um, our, our researchers always call them animist. And we're like, well, why don't you say traditional belief system? <laughs> um, or, you know, there's Muslims, but I mean, there's historical reason why in many places, ethnic minorities have converted or have been converted to Christianity. And, um, and there is this clear, strong logic to why Christian networks are so strong about ethnic groups. Not among all of them, but among some, and there's historical, um, you know, background to that. Um, but of course, you know, Buddhism has like, I think most 
religions in, in ethics of giving and charity. So um, it may be a different one, for example, the idea of merit making, that it is actually not addressed at the person who are giving something to, but, you know, is will improve your own um, spiritual standing, say, that is rooted in Buddhism, the idea of the gift, and, you know, being a gift to gods rather than a gift to people and so on. So I guess it's really important to not assume that a Christian notion of charity should dominate it all, but it's important to see, again, Muslim humanitarianism, ideas of zakat and so on, Christian charity, Buddhist idea of dan and so on, of merit making, are recognized how they variably feature in these activities. And one more, on the locality of mutual aid, do you think that it's emerging because many countries' governments, such as in Myanmar, ban international donor and financial transfers to the Burmese? In this sense, even refugees cannot receive international support, and hence they need to build and receive support from their own local networks. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I think that was part of someone's question. Um, it is specifically in situations where international actors are, you know, their hands are tied or they, um, you know, they aren't able to transfer money, that especially in the situations where they're not able or willing to step in, that these informal flows become more visible and more important. But that doesn't mean they're not already there beforehand and while we have international aid. So, for yeah, for example, I mean, in some of our research questions, I think it was in... Was it, I can't remember, I think in Pakistan or in Ethiopia, where our researcher asked, oh, do you receive money from international organizations? And they were like, no, nope, nothing, absolutely nothing. Um, but they were very forthcoming about reciprocity and informal aid. But of course, we knew, our researchers knew that they were receiving, they were definitely receiving something from international organizations. But it, obviously, both things happen at the same time. So it's not either or, but one becomes more visible when the other is absent. Thank you. Any more questions in the room? Thank you, Micah and Becky. And um, I just quickly wanted to ask um, how you kind of foresee the PDE project as a whole kind of playing into policy or how you're currently or hope to be working with policy actors to kind of incorporate your findings. I'm just interested. To Becky, know. would Great you like question. to answer this? <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good question. And I think it's a really important question for uh, researchers, especially those of us sitting in the global north. Um, and trying desperately to, um, especially in the UK at the moment, include all of our partners, but not being able to um, even get them here because of the way that the British government currently um, operates its border policies. Um, so a lot of the people we're very fortunate who work within the PDE programme um, are able to communicate with um, higher level um, policymakers and so are able to start attempting to feed in um, to those kinds of processes now that we're starting to get some of the results coming through but it's such a complex situation at the moment seeing um, I mean even today and yesterday the UK government trying to uh, further shut down um, movements of people um, around the world and you're seeing that increasingly um, with government so I think it's a really it's a really important question but one that we haven't quite figured out the answer to yet unless no you've got no no I mean what we've done already in January or one of our team members um they have held stakeholder workshops with um I think armed organizations civil society organizations we know what you call local stakeholders um in order to see how the PDE results might be useful for what they're doing um and we had something called local community profiles which is what people wanted say right ethnic armed organizations actually want to know what is happening on their patch, how many people are there, how much land they need, uh, what crops would work for them. So at the moment, we actually had a meeting yesterday where the situation was, right, 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 can you actually help us? Like, we would like livelihood improvement and we would like training workshops and we need to improve our current weaving techniques to be able to market the, the um, cloth more than just in Thailand, but Singapore. And then, of course, for us, I would say, you know, I'm just a migration or anthropology person. I had to know what livelihoods, you know, don't know, motorbikes, 
you know, so it's very real tension there where we're trying to support people and make something useful for them. But at the same time, really, um, you know, yeah, we're trying to do something. We're trying to listen to what you want, and maybe connect you with people who can help you. Um, but I think it has in many ways shown up our limits. Yeah, we point to maybe knowledge, but you can't eat knowledge. Um, what we have tried is to help train people so they can get jobs. Um, we try to raise awareness politically and, um, you know, if international organizations feel more able to kind of feed into these small scale aid streams that will also be useful. Whether we can really help much with getting different rice varieties planted that are more resistant to the current climate change patterns that they're experiencing, that would be good. But I think it's a tension that we all feel in the project. Um, so yeah, good question. Okay, that was actually a really good question to kind of wrap, it, <laughs> wrap <laughs> everything up. So unless anybody else has a really burning question or comment that they want to raise, I will bring everything to a close by thanking Micah very Thank much you. for a really so brilliant <laughs> presentation and question and answer session. Thanks to everyone who joined us online and in the room. Um, I just wanted to finish with, there was a comment online that I think summed up um, the importance of what we've been talking about here. Um, and this is from Nee Kin. Um, informal aid is very helpful to all IDPs because um, help can be reached directly and quickly to the people who need it. Um, this, there is, um, to get funding from an international NGO in Myanmar, local organizations need to be registered with the military. If organizations are registered with the military, they try and control things and then they cannot reach IDPs easily. So we're facing real difficulties right now. And so this is where informal aid becomes really, really important um, in these situations. So I wanted to kind of finish with, with a comment from someone actually experiencing it. Mm. Um, and then the final bits of housekeeping. Um, the recording of this lecture will be available on the IDS website and emailed to all attendees. And we'll be back with more Sussex development lectures throughout March. So keep an eye on the IDS website. Thank you, Becky. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.